Hello, this is Dietrich Kasui. I'd like to welcome you to the Urban Financial Services Coalition special session, The Voice of Young People in Today's Struggle for Equality and Equity. And we've brought together some of the best and brightest alumni of the Urban Financial Services Coalition Mark One Emerging Leaders Program to discuss the current issues that are going on today. And as always, uh, we do have an agenda for today. And with that, uh, we're going to have the welcome. <clears throat> welcome. Uh, we will also uh, have a bit of networking uh, for all of you to get to know each other and share uh, some interesting things about you. And then we will hear from the Urban Financial Services Coalition National President. We will introduce our speaker, our panelist um, for today. Uh, we'll have a conversation with them and then we'll open up the floor to some questions and you can send your questions either via chat or um, raise your hand to have us acknowledge you and you can ask your question um, and then we will share some upcoming events with urban financial services coalition and so with that we'll start with our networking um, all of you will be put into a breakout room if you are participating via computer you'll get a link all you have to do is click on that link and that will send you to the breakout room. If you're participating via telephone, the breakout room will automatically, you will automatically be put into a breakout room. And so what you would discuss during the breakout session is your name, uh, the company that you belong with or organization, and then share one example of how you supported the struggle for equality and or equity when you were young. So share one example of how you supported the struggle for equality and or equity when you were young. So click on the link and we'll meet you back here in just a moment. So welcome back. I'm glad you had a great session and a great breakout session. Um, hopefully I gave you enough time and y'all enjoyed um, meeting all of you. I see the thumbs up um, that you had an excellent time and you had the opportunity to uh, share uh, some of your thoughts and your ideas. So now I'd like to yield the floor to our national president, Ms. Ola May True Love of Kansas City. Um, Madam President, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mr. D2 Kasui. I certainly appreciate uh, the invitation to participate on this Zoom call this evening. It is so awesome to see all of you. And I just want to say that I am so proud of the Mark I students. I have read your bios and some information about you, and I was just smiling and just so excited and rushed home to get home so that I could, you know, listen to what you all have to say, what, where you've been and where you look to go. Uh, as we continue to grow our organization, as we continue to ask for additional support, I really need the young people to help me make this organization great because the groundwork has been done. We will be celebrating 50 years for Urban Financial Services Coalition in 2024. That's only three years away. And I'm going to need you all that have these skills as far as marketing and website and, and getting partners engaged. I need all of your help and all of your support. And you young people, you all are the ones that can do it. So uh, the people, the season, I like to refer to myself as a seasoned person. I used to call myself old all the time. But my daughter said, you need to make up your mind whether you're going to continue to dye your hair or whether, and you're going to be old or you're going to be young. So I haven't decided yet, but I love being young. I love being around young people. And thank you so much for everything that you all are doing tonight and what, we, what you will do in the future for us. D2 had mentioned earlier that we rolled out a new website. <clears throat> I really would like you all to look at that website and 
give me feedback on what you think about it. If there's things that you think we can do to improve that, I want you to send that information and let's just make this thing pop. And that's perfect on purpose is what my bishop says here in uh, Grandview, Missouri. So uh, I just want to say love and virtual hugs to all of you. I can ramble on, but D2 is going to probably tell me to be quiet here in a second. But again, thank you and big hand claps to all of you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, President True Love. And we appreciate your support, um, not only in your role as national president, but in your various roles that you have participated with the Kansas City chapter and the Kansas City chapter, you know, sponsoring um, you used to participate in the program. And even when you're on the regional level, you supported the Mark One program and the young people um, that participated, that have participated in the program. And it's because of your leadership that we continue to have an opportunity and a platform for young people to be involved with Urban Financial Services Coalition. Moving forward uh, with our program, and I'll introduce our panelists. The first of our panelists is Ms. Elise E. Evans. She is a recent um, 2020 graduate of the Executive Masters of Business Administration uh, program for Virginia Commonwealth University. Professionally, Elise has spent most of the last 10 years dedicating her time and talents to the hospitality food service industry in various roles. In her most, in her most current role, Elise operated as the retail brands manager of the Chick-fil-A and Subway located within the Virginia Commonwealth University Medical Center's campus under employment with Aramark. Prior to that, Elise enjoyed managing the cafeteria at the John Hopkins Bayview Medical Center located in Baltimore, Maryland, Maryland also under Aramark. And Elise participated in the Urban Financial Services Coalition St. Louis Mark One Emerging Leaders Program. And not only has she been a participant, but she's also been on the execution side of the program and has been helping us to uh, continue to develop and train the next generation of leaders. Let's give Elise Evans a big round of applause. Our next uh, participant on our panel tonight is uh, Mr. Michael Franklin. He is a senior le legal communications major from Kansas City, Kansas City, Kansas City, Kansas, uh, right over the river, right? And he is ready to upgrade Howard University as the 60th. Howard University Student Association Executive Vice President. Michael has a dense and diverse ex extracurricular resume, having served as a Deputy Chief of Staff and Vice President for the Kathy Hughes School of Communication Student Council, Vice President of External Affairs for the Coalition of Activists, students celebrating the acceptance of diversity and equality, Chair of the Hilltop Policy Board, Vice President for the Howard University Speech and Debate Team, and the competing member of the Howard University Mock Mock Trial Team. Michael's also proud to have organized the inaugural Black Speech Speechwriter Symposium held at Howard University in 2019. And he participated in the Mark I program in Kansas City, and he was sponsored by the Kansas City chapter. Let's give Michael a big round of applause. Next. Hey, you. <laughs> there we go. Next we you have, know. <laughs> next we have Marquello M. McDaniels. He's a recent graduate of Howard University, where he received his degree in accounting. Marquillo has worked for several financial institutions, financial institution entities, and has experience in the corporate realm. He is interested in fraud and forensic accounting. After graduation, Marquillo began his career as a finance and accounting development program analyst at PNC Bank, rotating through corporate tax, corporate accounting, enterprise risk management, 
Finance and Finance Capital and Liquidity Reporting. He currently works at Dixon Hughes Goodman LLP as a risk advisory consultant. And Mark One, uh, Mark Willow participated in the Mark One St. Louis with Elise Evans. And let's give her, let's give him a big round of applause. All right, and last but not least is Anushka Sakar. Uh, she works as a senior communications associate, associate with the Hub Project. Prior to joining the Hub Project, she worked at Booth Allen Hamilton in the Strategic Innovation Group, where she used her strategy and communications knowledge to support federal clients in the healthcare space. Anushka is a proud 2015 alumni of the Mark I program hosted by Urban Financial Services Coalition, and she was sponsored by the Detroit chapter. Anushka is a graduate of the University of Michigan, where she studied political science and history. And during her time at the University of Michigan, Anushka interned at Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign headquarters in Brooklyn, New York, and later took a semester off to work on the campaign's fundraising team based out of Clinton's personal office. After returning to Ann Arbor, Anushka ran for and was, success and was successfully elected the University of Michigan student body president. Anushka and her running mate were the first two women of color to be elected to student body president and vice president in the university history. They won the highest number of votes in university, university history. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big round of applause to Anushka Sakar. All right. Excellent, excellent, excellent. <clears throat> so we have a great panel, and um, I would like to just start off with just a ge general question for all three panelists um, to answer. <clears throat> and I would just start off with just to start off with a little um, easy question and just say, you know, thinking back about your time and your participation in the Mark I program, you know, what was your top leadership insight that you got from participating in the Mark I leadership uh, program with Urban Financial Services Coalition? And we'll go ahead and have ladies first, and we'll start with you, Elise. So one of my biggest takeaways was that, and it might be a little abstract, but when people of color could come together and agree on a certain topic, that they can do powerful things. Um, before um, undergrad, I had never heard of the Urban Financial Services Coalition. And so just the impact this organization has put on me, I can only imagine the other generations that it's also impacting as well. Thank you. And this goes. Um, as someone who works in communications right now, I think one of the biggest lessons I took out of the Mark One program uh, was that having an idea is 20% of success and 80% of it is being able to tell the story of the idea and persuade people to buy into it. Um, and I got to experience that with my uh, partner Malik when we presented our business idea at the, at the conference back in 2015. And I have carried that lesson with me since then. A absolutely and your presentation was just awesome too i still remember i still have i still have the powerpoint <laughs> I, just, I just look at it and say oh man you know there's some smart ideas and she's still still uh sharing ideas uh to this day uh michael what would you add um i would add that during my participation with the mark one program it was a stark reminder of the human, the importance of just the human aspect in any sort of professional dealings. Like it's not about just solely achieving a goal, you know, but it's about building those relationships with folks. So they end up being a community that you're able to lean on in the years to come. Because for someone like me where working in financial services isn't my overarching goal, that doesn't stop me from being able to view the importance of the community and still support the Urban Financial Services Coalition wherever I go. And y'all were really one of my first professional communities that welcomed me with open arms and still provide support to this day. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been our pleasure, Michael. 
you know, it's easy to support people who are up to big things. And you, you've definitely been up to big things. Um, next, we'll go with uh, Marquello. So I would say one of my biggest takeaways from the Mark One program, what's a reminder of the six degrees of separation? Uh, it has, ever since I've learned that concept from the Mark One program, it has truly been a benefit to me um, in regards to learning who I'm connected with, in regards to helping, helping myself be able to build a community around me and to be able to reach out to people that I need because I understand the, the concept of six degrees of separation. A a absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, um, thank you all um, for, the, for sharing your insights. You know, it really starts with um, having good young people to be a part of the program and to, you know, take the talent that you have and to share that talent and to share that talent with the colleagues um, that you met during the week, you know, and I know you probably missed the morning workouts, you know, getting up so early. And, uh, and then going to bed, you know, late at night, uh, you know, because you had those things. I know you miss all those things, um, but hopefully that, you know, prepared you for some of the opportunities um, that you've had as adults. <clears throat> um, so let's go ahead and get into the mix of kind of where we are today um, in terms of the struggle for equality um, and it, the struggle for, um, for equity. And, um, <clears throat> You know, when you think about the current time um, that we're in, what is the important message um, that you feel that people are missing um, or people or misconceptions that people have about young people who are currently participating um, in the protest, of, of currently participating in, um, in the current struggle? We'll start with you, Michael. What are some misconceptions that you think people um, have about the young people participating in the current um, unrest? Oh, I would say some misconceptions are that everything is very disorganized, you know, that it's kind of scattered and reactionary, and that there might not be any particular end goal or like a means to that goal. When it comes to young folks revolting, like against the status quo and the various systems that we've seen just produce very inequitable and horrible results for black and brown folks across the country. And so when we are making our calls to action and making our pleas to fight for a better future, like there are plans, there are specifics about that. Like when folks say things like defund the police, it's not meaning that, oh, there's just never going to be anything like immediately there will just be no police ever again and it will be chaos but it's no we're taking that money away and we're reinvesting that into social services we're reinvesting that into build building safe and healthy communities and then eventually when we're building up communities then hopefully that leads to a future where you won't need militarized police forces or where you see some police forces to the point I think it was in LA where one of their school district had tanks and grenades and rifles as like a common purchase for their school resource officers. Like it's things like that, that just, that funding doesn't need to be allocated whatsoever. Absolutely. Um, who else like to jump in and answer that answer? Who would like to answer the question? <laughs> Anishka, what are your thoughts? What's the, from the top of misconceptions? I I would say that one misconception I see a lot is uh, assuming that young people don't know what they mean by certain demands. Um, a lot of the organizations and networks that have been organizing for years around racial justice in the U.S. Uh, have been youth-led. Um, since the beginning of movements in the U.S., they have been youth-led. And to Michael's point, when we hear young organizers and advocates say something like defund the police, that demand is something that comes from a long history of literature and study and uh, organizing work. It's not, it's, not, it's not an empty demand. And the people who are advocating for the defunding of police and the abolition of prisons and police departments and other carceral institutions that exist know what that means. They, they are not issuing uh, blanket statements. Um, so I, I think I've seen a lot of finger wagging from 
uh, more seasoned people who have maybe been, uh, they've lost optimism for uh, the possibility for these grand demands. Um, and I think one of the things I would encourage people to do is trust that the people who are working on the front lines to actualize those demands know what they're asking for and know that it's worth fighting for. Absolutely, absolutely. At least on my call, anything I'd like to add before we move on to the next question? I would just add that one misconception also as well would be that um, young people don't have enough experience to defend what they're trying to defend um, because maybe it's perceived that because of their age, there's a certain level of experience that they'll need to be able to explain or have experienced racism. But because it's been so normalized and culturalized, we've all at least once experienced something that was based off of a racist action or word. And I'd like to put out there that just because we're younger, or even younger generations than us, even if for, for some lucky reason we haven't personally experienced racism, we have empathy for those who do. I mean, George Floyd could have easily been my father, if I had a brother, my brother, maybe my future husband, and maybe I might not have experienced racism, but, but I have, but I feel empathy for his family. Who, who wants to see their father or their brother on live TV die because of the color of his skin? So I would just say, yeah, we might not have the personal experience at a minimum, but we're feeling the empathy to this situation. And so that's why we're also protesting. Absolutely, thank you. Marquello, anything you want to add to your un un No, I think they, they did a really good job with that one. <laughs> okay, great. Um, well, let me ask this, um, this question to uh, Marquillo, you know, as a black man matriculating through corporate America, how are companies working to address retaining and recruiting black talent to firms and what action steps are they taking to make the workforce more, uh, more inclusive? Sure. Great question, D2. So I can speak on a personal level. I've, um, I can personally say that I've seen companies start to have those honest dialogues um, within the corporate space about not only retracting and retaining their black employees, but what actually their em black employees go through on a day-to-day -day basis, like the different type of things such as microaggressions. Um, I've seen companies as far as um, and the big four, they're starting to tie a lot of their partners' um, bonuses and incentives to how many people of color they're retaining and um, training, how many people of color that they're actually uh, mentoring. So I'm seeing a lot from like leadership above in regards to making sure that they're doing what they need to do to make it a more diverse workforce. Uh, I can also speak to the fact of, I know a lot of companies, particularly mine, we're having the conversation about pay inequities. Um, I was speaking on it earlier in our small chat that uh, women of color, particularly, they're still being one of the lowest paid groups of people in corporate America, although they're one of the most educated groups. So we're having now those conversations with HR people to say, listen, the data actually shows that still in 2020, women of color are being paid less. How can we address that um, in equity? Uh, thank you, Marquello. Um, if, would any of the other panelists like to add anything to um, Marquello's uh, response? Okay, great. Uh, so I would like to throw the um, question to uh, Michael, uh, uh, Michael Franklin. Um, Michael, when you uh, think about uh, being a student, a current student, um, at Howard University, how have um, how have y'all organized um, the rest of the students to participate, and how have y'all balanced the COVID concerns um, and still finding ways to uh, demonstrate um, and participate in the um, in trying to uh, transform um, what's currently going on? Well, that's a great question all around. 
and we really just got in creative like knowing that everyone can really come around like shared principles of like justice equity equality like these are things that everyone believes in in the movement but like not everyone's going to be out on the front lines protesting i know for me like being back at home i live in a house full of folks who are all immunocompromised so me going out to a protest puts them at risk so i'm not able to go out and be on the front lines doing that but instead it's trying to leverage whatever platform i may have to try and fight for justice fight for change so one thing the howard university student association did early on in these protests were a match system of um, fundraising through social media charging students faculty staff anyone in the community to donate eighteen dollars and sixty seven cents in lieu of howard being founded in 1867 and we were able to end up bundling and leading donations of about twelve hundred thirteen hundred dollars to various organizations across the country supporting protesters who are out on the front lines for some folks it might be writing op-eds in their local newspapers or amplifying the work that some students are doing out on the ground across the country. Like we've had some students who have been able to leverage their way into meetings with their governors. We saw a student organize the largest protest in support of racial justice in Hawaii ever organized. And we've seen students giving speeches at protest and speaking roles, not only in Minneapolis, but in states across the country. And I think it just shows that there's a there's room for everyone. And it doesn't mean that you're out on the ground and being able to make that impact. But you can make that impact even from your bedroom, from your home. But know that you're still using your voice to try and advocate for change in some sort of manner. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael. The, uh, Anushka, I know that um, you have uh, been participating, um, you know, um, in the uh, in the protest, you know, what has been your view of participating, you know, on the streets? Um, and can you also talk a little bit about, um, you know, you know, you're not African American, you're a person of color. Can you talk about what it talk what it what it is like to be an ally um, and to participate um, in the discussion and in the protest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll start with the second part of that question because I feel like that'll answer the first part. Um, one of the things that I have been reading and talking to people in my sphere a lot about over the last couple of years has been the difference between being an ally and being an accomplice. And um, in corporate workspaces, in nonprofit workspaces like mine, um, in college communities, we talk about allyship a lot and the difference between being an ally and being an accomplice in my understanding is the difference between me uh, posting on social media or, you know, expressing some sort of frustration with the moment and being an accomplice means that I am willing to invest my time, my energy, my resources, um, my talents into uh, taking down the structures that oppress all of us, even if I am not directly oppressed by those structures or if I am less oppressed by them. And so one of the reasons why I think it's important that I name that as a non-Black person of color, I have a certain level of privilege uh, that it is my job as an accomplice to uh, the movements for justice in this country to exercise that and to show up to protests when possible, to spend money for causes where possible, to organize resources, to fight hard where I can, but maybe somebody else cannot. Um, and so I've seen a lot of young people showing up to do that, some for the first time in, in the last month or so. Um, and it gives me hope that this is more than just a moment and that this is the beginning or sort of the early cadence of a, a long movement that will be uh, bringing in a lot of newcomers to the accomplice ship. Absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Good. And that's such a powerful um, statement is that, you know, they are our allies and they are accomplices. And um, the option of doing nothing, you know, says a lot, right? You know, if you don't fall in one of those uh, two buckets, um, then the 
person, you know, should explore themselves and, and think about, you know, where they're, where they stand and how people view where they stand. Um, and I'd like to throw this question to, um, to Elise. It's, uh, when you think about this moment, um, is it more important for us to have policy changes or is it more important for us to change attitudes and mindsets? At this point, I think we need a healthy dose of both, um, more so though on the policy change, because no matter how much we try to make something cultural, sometimes it just does not translate to policy changes, and that's not enough. Um, we're dealing with things in terms of policies like redlining, and again, if, if we're all supposed to be equal and those that argue that all lives matter, then why, if I live on this side of the street, is my school funded so poorly compared to if I lived on the other side of the street? It's, um, in, in history, we have seen some cultural norms apply enough pressure to produce policy changes, but in a perfect world, policy changes should automatically be created to create and, to sh and demonstrate and show equitable, equal, truly equitable circumstances for all people, regardless of their skin color. And so, yes, again, cultural norms can push. I mean, Pepsi is now thinking about taking Aunt Jemima off of the syrup bottle and also with the Uncle Ben on the rice. But is that really going to affect me as an employee in a large white corporation when I get a job and I'm still getting 60 cents less than the CEO just because of the color of my skin? So those policy changes need to be pushed much harder than any culture norm at this time. Uh, anybody would like to add? Any of you like to add on to Elisa's uh, comments to policy or attitude? Elise, I think you make a great point. Um, one of the things that I've seen that sort of supports the point that you made is this graphic that I keep seeing on social media and I'll share it around, but it's a graphic that has a bunch of different circles and in each circle there's a label and some of these labels say disruptor, some say innovator, some say thinker, and it, it made it visible for me in a way that I hadn't visualized that all of us have a role to play in liberating ourselves from the, the pay disparities from prison, uh, industrial complexes, from police departments, we all have a role to play and some of us have different strengths than others. And so it is our job to leverage the privileges and the strengths and the talents and the resources that we have to play the best role we can. Um, and so at least I just wanna thank you for making that point. Absolutely, absolutely. Excellent. Well, um, I'd like to go to um, Marquello Oh, before I go to Marquello, I, I would like to just touch on this uh, point of uh, of racism with police. Um, you're from the uh, Caribbean, correct? So, as as a um, a woman from the Caribbean, um, you know what kind of um, inequalities or um, uh, or types of racism show up uh, in the Caribbean for you? Sure. So racism as what we call continental America doesn't show up the same way that it shows up specifically on the island I'm from in the Virgin Islands, St. Thomas. Um, it's a little harder to directly have a white person and a person's of color space because we're 80% African American or people of color. Um, only 15% is actually white on the island. But we, we lean more on social status and eco-social status uh, disparities. So what little racism, direct racism is there? Um, as a local, you know that the white people tend or the, the white people tend to live on top of the hills where the poor black people live around the hill area. Um, and again, so that has to do with social status. So traditionally, the higher up the hill you lived, the more money it was assumed that you had um, to meet those gaps between the races. So again, it's not directly um, having pr police brutality because of the color of your skin, because again, the majority of the cops are also African-American or people of color, but there's levels to, and there's behaviors around the assumption of how much money you and your family make within the community. Absolutely, thank you. You know, and, um... You know, sometimes we have to really have a conversation between um, 
uh, classism and uh, racism and um, social inequalities, you know, they are inter intertwined. And sometimes people like to make them simplistic um, and, you know, create, you know, think one antidote or one strategy deals with one. Uh, it's really something that has to be uh, approached in a lot of different ways um, because there's a lot of things that uh, happen. Um, so here, here's my um, other question. And before um, we will take some questions from um, from all of you, you can send your question in the chat um, if you like, or uh, raise your hand, and we'll acknowledge you and allow you to ask your question. Um, but here's my question for um, our panelists. You know, what do you say um, to um, white people or um, non people of color when they say that? Um, you know, racism doesn't really exist. You know, maybe if he had just complied with the police, you know, things wouldn't have happened. You know, I wasn't, you know, uh, around when slavery got started and, you know, we uh, passed all these laws. Uh, why can't we just move forward? What, what do you say when, uh, well, one, do people have those type of conversations around you? If, and if you don't, um, <clears throat> You know, what would you say if someone came to you with that type of conversation? Sure. So I'll take on partial of that question in regards to um, do people have those conversations in regards to someone saying, oh, does racism still exist? Like, you know, no one was alive from slavery. Um, and one of the things that I always do, and, and Elise kind of spoke on it, well, she already spoke on it, um, I point them to systematic racism. Um, and things that have trickled down since uh, um, the end of slavery, such as Jim Crow laws. I always point to people about redlining. I explain to them, this is how the pipe to prison um, pipeline, I mean, school to prison pipeline started. Also show people the um, housing disparities, the, 1960, the 1965 rights, uh, Discrimination Rights Act, and things that have like trickled down since slavery that are still oppressing um, African-Americans. So yes, we might not be on a plantation, but if you look at the prison population, African Americans still make up the majority of that population of, particularly um, men, make up the pr uh, prison population. So I always try to point people to things that they can see today and say, well, yeah, we might not be in um, chains anymore or on plantations, but here's other ways that we're affected. Okay. Any, any other thoughts? Um, um, you go ahead, Michael. I, I would um, add, like, the non-constructive answer I would give to someone is just shut up, because <laughs> it's really frustrating to have to deal with that level of ignorance in the great year of 2020, because there are too many visual and visceral examples of folks being mistreated without merit all the time. And it's just a matter of we have to, like, if folks are popping off saying things like that, then it's pro they probably aren't going to be convinced. And it's not worth my time or educational labor to, like, do that work with them. But on the most basic level, it's just like you can look in any system that exists in America, from financial services to politics to education to housing, like... One of the easiest personal examples for me is going to a school in Kansas City, Kansas, and we were the only black school that competed in our local debate league. And so we saw our opposing, our opponents just a county over have five, six coaches prepping each team before the round and their facilities being a lot better with working water fountains, smart boards, technology for the students. And while they have all those coaches helping one team before the round, we only have one coach for our entire team of 30, 40 students. We don't have smart boards. We don't have the fancy laptop stands to sit our laptops on. And it's like those disparities that come without merit because it's like, yeah, we have the brain and we have the talent and we'll still beat you in rounds. But like the fact that we have to overcome these variety of barriers without merit just show some of the several comprehensive issues within society. And you can find visceral examples like that any and everywhere in like any industry, any organization, any institution in this country. Thank you. At least you were going to add. 
Uh, yeah, for me, if the person I'm having the conversation is worth, is ready and willing to at least listen, it's it's about showing more so, yes, racism or slavery is over, but the effects of it are still alive and well. And it's about showing them that, and like Marquilla and Michael said, that people of color are so this 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 disadvantage like some are more advantaged than others but overall i literally cannot i literally go into a store and as soon as i go to burberry before i open my mouth before i open my pockets i am judged i'm being followed people are thinking i'm stealing and it's simply because of the color of my skin they don't understand that i have the money i need to buy whatever i need out of the store maybe i'm just looking i, I don't have any, any intentions to buy it at all but the purpose is the minute i walk into the store i'm already judged and to point that out that you as a white person you don't have that problem you can walk through burberry you can touch everything you want and never feel guilty about it or worried about are they thinking i'm going to put this in my pocket showing little subtle differences such as that that ripple and affect us on so many higher levels i think would is worth the conversation having with someone that's like oh slavery's over yes but the judgment is alive and well thank you Anisha, any thoughts you would like to add i just i want to highlight something that michael said which is that Sometimes there are people that you cannot persuade and no matter how much you sit down with them and you show them the numbers, you show them, uh, you know, your lived experience, they cannot be persuaded by you. And a big part of my work in organizing is identifying who the best messenger for a difficult message is. And so a lot of the times it's not going to be me. It's not going to be anybody on this zoom call, but it is on the heads and shoulders of people like us who are advocating for this change to identify, okay, if my 65 year old white neighbor who is in denial that the police only show up to black families homes for noise complaints, but never show up to white families homes for noise complaints, if she's in denial about that, who can talk to her from our neighborhood to make her stop calling them? Because it's probably not me. But maybe it's the other white woman across the street who is a little bit more sympathetic and you can go talk to her and then she's on board and you get her to talk to the woman that lives next door to you. Obviously that's a deeply simplified example, but I think that's something worth calling out that in organizing theory, we talk a lot about models of who, of how to organize. And one of the most important parts of organizing and persuading people, especially the least persuadable, is identifying the right messenger for it. Absolutely, absolutely. And that, that, that is powerful. Um, one of the things that um, I think people don't give a lot of credit to, especially in prior movements, is the strategy. You know, uh, there was a lot of strategy <laughs> that was going on. People didn't just wake up one day and, uh, and just protest. You know, certain things and who protested and who was involved, there was some, some strategy, there was some strategic moves um, that was made. Um, here's a question uh, that comes from the... Uh, from the audience, which is, how do you feel about someone who wants to remain neutral on the subject of Black Lives Matter? Who would like to take that on? I can take that one. <laughs> like, there is no neutral. Like, silence is compliance with violence and violent systems. So like there's no middle ground to him and Hall and act like you're playing both sides. Either you're going to have the courage to speak up against injustice or you're going to end up being silent about things that matter. And that means that that person sucks for real, for real. Thank you, Michael. Any additional thoughts? I have a clarification. Are they saying in regards to the like the movement in itself, or just Black Lives Matter? Like, because when I hear Black Lives Matter, I'm I'm thinking both the movement and as well as just Black people in general. Because it's like you're questioning or you're wanting to be neutral about Black Lives, and you you're not for Black Lives if you have to be neutral in my in my personal opinion. Yeah, well, you know, some people you know will choose to not say anything when people you know, bring these, you know, type of issues up. 
you know, than other issues, um, you know, people put responses that, you know, all lives matter. Um, you know, that's, you know, kind of like the ongoing conversation um, now. And uh, um, so the question really is, you know, how do we handle that conversation? How do y'all handle that conversation as young people? Um, and how do we distinguish, you know, between uh, Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter? How is that reconciled? If no one else wants to go, I can like add on <laughs> real quick. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, like anyone who says all lives matter is inherently acting in bad faith because they are making the, they're assuming that when folks say black lives matter, they're simply saying only black lives matter, but not saying that black lives matter too. And so for that to be your inherent thought when folks are saying Black Lives Matter, it shows that like you're just inherently antagonistic to the idea of Black self-determination. And like that's an issue. Like take for example, like one of the most, the, one of the simplest examples to me is like we have Breast Cancer Awareness Month and you have different awareness months. You don't see someone showing up saying, hey, well, all cancers matter. Why, are we, why do we have a breast cancer awareness month? And so anyone who just wants to try and derail the conversation in that matter, they're not engaging with a willingness to try to understand what's going on. I'd like to add to that as well. Um, when I hear all lives matter, I think, um, those people are kind of contradicting themselves because, again, if they truly realized all lives matter, they would know that right now, yes, all lives matter, but the Black ones or the people of color are suffering right now. Technically, we've been suffering, but right now we're at the point to we've had enough and we're speaking out and we're trying to do our best to, to really point out that, hey, we're suffering, we're tired of this, help us, help us help ourselves, let us help ourselves. Um, exactly, is in the comments, all lives can't matter until Black lives. I mean, if, and Michael gave a great analogy, but I'll give you another one. So if you have three children and one of your, your children is not doing well at the time, all of your children matter, but your focus is going to be on that child that's not doing so well until that child is well, so that you can all truly be well and matter. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do have a question from um, Ola. Do you would like to um, ask your question? Well, um, really more than a question, but a statement. Um, as a seasoned, mature Black woman in the financial services industry in corporate America, I can say that I have definitely uh, felt and understood everything that's happened that has us here where we are today with the fact that black people we've been tired but we're really tired and i'm so proud of the young people that are stepping up and they are purposely making a statement to say these things will change not only are black young people saying it, white young people, Hispanic young. I mean, we have a generation that is not going to continue to allow this to go on. Yes, absolutely, mm -hmm. all lives matter. But right now, we're talking about the Black lives and the injustice that we have seen, the knees that have been on my neck for 44 years remain on my neck. The fact that I work 10 times harder than my white counterpart, okay? But I do not get the pay that they get. No, I don't know what they're paid, but I know I'm not making what they're making. So I get very, very emotional about this conversation, but I'm so proud that all of you on this call, the speakers that are here today, you all understand the importance of what has to be done and you are strategically working on making it happen. I might not live to see it, but I know that my, my, if my daughter has children, her children, you know, my grandchildren, great grandchildren, great nieces and nephews, hopefully they will experience a world 
where there will not be these injustices that so many of us have experienced. So don't get me to crying and starting on all of this because I will. Because it's just, it's very deep for me because we all should be respected as people. We're all God's children. And I just believe that we should do the right thing by everybody. So I'm going to get off my bandwagon and just, I just had to say that though. It's just like, so crazy. emotional for me, but you guys are going to make it happen. I know you are. I know you are. I'm just so proud. So proud. Absolutely. I, I want to shift the, the conversation just a little bit. I want to take this to Anishka. Uh, and so while we're talking about finance, we're talking about economics. Can you talk about the intersection of economic injustice and racial injustice in this country? and what we can do today to start working towards remedying these types of injustices? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. Um, my mind first goes back to what Elise had just said a couple of questions ago, that there is a role for policymaking to play here, and that's where I'm most knowledgeable because that's where my work is. Um, so I work with uh, an organization that tries to fix our federal tax code and our uh, federal budget legislation so that it is uh, not racist, not sexist, uh, it is not anti-LGBTQ, um, and any other number of marginalized communities that are targeted by our laws and uh, federal codes. And one of the things that um, comes to mind, it was a, an example I think that Marquella mentioned, is redlining. Um, another example that comes to mind is how banks issue loans. Um, a, a woman I work with in Waterloo, Iowa, by the name of Miss Rashonda Young. She's a black woman, owns a small business. She was named a community champion by President Obama. She's won a whole slew of awards on the boards of all these local organizations. And her bank recently uh, denied her a loan despite already having issued her multiple other loans and told her that, they, that she should take her business elsewhere. Um, and she actually sued the bank through a class action lawsuit with an organization within the government called the Consumer uh, Financial Protections Bureau. And the CFPB helped uh, Miss Young sue and she ended up winning the lawsuit. And the bank has refused to give her the money that it owes her. It has maintained that it will not deliver the, the, the loan that it owes her um, despite being ordered to by the court. And this is one of truly countless examples that comes to mind of where economic injustice is directly rooted in racial injustice and vice versa. And the erosion of both of these forms of injustice must be simultaneous. So one of the things that I try to focus on in my work and I try to remind my team to focus on is that there is no economy that works for everybody. There is no tax code that works for everybody until these systems work for our most marginalized people until the tax code stops taxing black families more than it taxes white families, until banks stop uh, issuing higher interest rates to black families and lower income brown families, until our universities uh, start treating our students of color and black students and undocumented students with respect, these in economic injustices will perpetuate. Um, absolutely, I think you coined it well. And that's one of the missions of Urban Financial Services Coalition is to um, deal with these issues um, from the economic aspects. You know, to get to this point in the struggle, you know, we had to stop being property, <laughs> right? We need to stop being property um, and you start um, saying, hey, can we level the, the playing field and get access to education? And then with access to education, we, you know, we want equal protection under the law. You know, um, now we have access to some of these jobs. You know, now we have access to, you know, using the fully participated um, in the economy. Um, and though we've made some progress, you know, the fight is still there, you know, and we have to go to what the next level is because the race, the starting line for the race is not equal, you know, and, um, and so people, you know, like often say that, you know, hey, we have a, a, a meritocracy. You know, everyone, you know, has access to the same opportunity. Um, so therefore, you know, we shouldn't have anything to uh, complain about. Um, and I, I just want to ask Aniska one quick question uh, before we get to our final questions. And this is uh, about uh, 
because you uh, you attended a majority uh, university. Um, and one of the things that they've been uh, talking about uh, about majority universities is that a lot of them only accept 5%, 10% of the people who um, actually apply. Um, and so there's some a lot of resistance to, um, you know, um, you know, getting that pool, um, you know, more equitable or getting people with, with different voices. Um, <clears throat> and what do you think needs to be done to change the education, college education system that would allow uh, greater access, um, you know, to education? Because part of education is not only okay, I, I go to this particular school and companies recruit at these particular schools, is that also is a different level of attention, there's a different level of uh, additional things that go on that people get access to, and we, if you're only accepting 5%, and therefore you even have wealthy people trying to cheat the system, <laughs> because they're only letting 5%, and these uh, financial, these uh, you know, institutions also operate as nonprofits, you know, so their endowments are growing tax free. And so that's really, that's a benefit that they get. Um, so it's a lot, I asked you a big question. <laughs> you want me to there. solve <laughs> education, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like boiling water, right? Go ahead. Exactly. What are some of your thoughts around that? Well, I'm glad you asked me an easy question. <laughs> uh, I'll talk, I'll talk specifically about the University of Michigan because that's my alma mater. It is situated in my home area. I am well, I'm familiar with what happens there because of being involved with student government there. So some stats for y'all before I get started. Black enrollment at Michigan when I was there was at 4%. There are 46,000 students at the university and there are majority black cities all across the state and there's no reason for black enrollment to be as low as it is, except for gatekeeping. Second stat for you, the endowment of the University of Michigan, no matter how high of a number you're thinking of, I promise you it's higher, it's $12.5 billion. And what they just did a couple days ago is decide that they were going to increase tuition for students coming in the fall, despite the fact that classes are going to be remote, despite the fact that we are in a national recession and pandemic, and we know who pays the price for that disproportionately when organizations and frankly businesses like public universities with endowments the size of mega corporations do that kind of thing. So when I was at University of Michigan, we tried to emphasize that as public school students, it is our duty to understand as citizens, as civically engaged people that the inequities in education don't start in college. They start at birth. They start in where you grow up, they start in your zip code, they start in the schools you have access to when you're a child, they start about nutrition, uh, family income and mobility, all sorts of factors contribute to this, right? And so as a public school educated child and now adult, I am a firm believer in state investments in public education. Another stat for you that's gonna blow your mind, Investment in the state of Michigan in higher education, so in colleges and universities, if you account for inflation, did not change from 1965 to 2018. And that is an active policy decision. Governors, state legislators, all these people who control our state governments, who make determinations about how much money we spend, what our moral document of a budget looks like on schools, decide black schools don't matter. Low-income school districts don't matter. Immigrant community schools don't matter. And if I had to prescribe two things that we could do, which obviously is reductive, but two things, because I don't have all time in the world, I would say our states need to invest in uh, underinvested public school districts. And I would also say that Universities need to worry not just about recruitment of black students and brown students, but they also need to worry about retention because once you get to college at a PWI, that is when the, the disproportionate experiences really kick into play. Who's able to afford textbooks? Who's able to afford to live close to campus? Who's able to afford health insurance? Um, and if the universities aren't willing to make investments in um, 
making life itself at college easier, then there is no way that education at these universities is gonna get any easier or more accessible for people. Absolutely powerful. And while we're on this topic, thank you, Aniska, for excellent points. While we're on this topic, you know, we can't uh, not move on from this topic without talking about historically black colleges. Um, and what do we do um, with historically black colleges in terms of, you know, some are declining, and the numbers are declining. Um, and so how do we reinvent, how do we uh, get them activated, and um, how do we move the ball forward so that they uh, will continue to be in, uh, in existence um, to serve this um, important community? Um, so uh, some of our HBCU grads, do y'all have some, some thoughts around that, how we empower our historically black colleges? I know for, you mentioned retention purposes and meeting financial needs. Some schools have, or historically black colleges have decided to pivot a little bit in terms of starting to offer admissions or more admission slots to people that are not traditionally of color and that worries me. I get that they need the financials, but it worries me because traditionally people of color go to HBCUs for a specific purpose. They want that community. They want to be seen. They want to be heard. And so if you start losing your touch and looking for financial outlets in that way, you, you start to mess with the culture and the experience of what a traditional HBCU has to offer. And so, again, I think it has to do with some of the disparities in terms of, there's been so many successful African-American people that have graduated from HBCUs, but are we honestly giving back as we should, as white people do to their institutions? Um, and to be fair, sometimes is the question might be, can we afford it? Being that, again, I'm being paid less than my white colleague and I have to balance my bills. So it just, all of the equalities kind of just wrap itself into this loophole of, because we're so disadvantaged sometimes, things are are not the, against the way they're supposed to be equality wise. But going back to HBCUs that decide to use non-traditional people of color for their admissions, it worries me because again, that experience is gonna be different. And I wonder if we can truly still be a HBCU if we're offering more and more seats to people that don't appreciate that culture. Michael, any thoughts? Yeah, Elise has it like 500% right. Like I wholeheartedly agree with so much, like with everything she just said. I think one thing is that HBCUs tend to not have a culture of giving when it comes to alum wanting to give back. And part of that can be due to tumultuous experiences with administrators and like with the administration at the institution where they don't trust to give money back. But another part of that is the disproportionate impact of student debt that Black students face in this nation. Because for a lot of Black students to be able to matriculate fully through college, they have to take out a ton of loans. And then they're focused on paying back those loans rather than being able to donate to their institutions. And when it comes to different folks supporting HBCUs, like a lot of folks forget that there are a hundred plus HBCUs out there. And I know like as a Howard student, oftentimes we see like we side eye a lot of the tweets where it's like, there's more HBCUs that exist besides Howard, Morehouse, Spelman, NCAT. And like, while they might be frustrating to see because it's like, we aren't, ha we aren't in the best of circumstances right now. They also are very accurate. And like, instead of trying to like, poke at Howard Morehouse Spelman, those larger HBCUs, there should be a focus on amplifying the other HBCUs at that moment in time, rather than trying to take shots at the others. Because if we're able to build just like the overarching institutions of HBCUs a lot more, then that's how you're going to build that power. You're going to build that collective influence, you know, and that comes from like federal legislation and increasing federal funding 
and like lobbying on the hill that's like empowering organizations like the uncf and the tmcf and really just making sure that not only are alum active and willing to support but making sure that you can meet those financial needs and not have a dependence on money on the basis of whether or not there's a friendly president in office willing to allocate that money for an HBCU. Excellent, excellent. We got so many questions in the chat, you know, but we can't talk all night because these young people got some other things that they need, need to do tonight. So what I would like to do is end on, um, on two questions. Um, for the, for each one of our panelists, you know, one, I'd like for you to uh, share uh, what the season people can do to support you um, in this moment. In this moment, um, and then two, you know, what do you think is the top priority um, that um, young people should be focused on in in moving the ball forward in this race for um, equity and equality? We'll start with you, Elise. Sure, for me, and it's it's taken me a while, but for me, seasoned people, when we finally have the courage or become humble enough to ask for feedback and help with situations that we're facing, please, please, please try your best to point us in a direction or help us in some way. Um, I know we're not always the most receptive. I know I understand we don't always, when you freely give advice and we're not ready for it, we don't take it or we just brush you off. But when we finally, again, humble ourselves or just are that desperate for some advice, especially pertaining to problems of for people of color, please point us in some type of direction, even if it's explaining your own situation with it or what you might have done or what you think you could have done for that. Could you um, repeat the second question for me? The second question is, uh, what, what do you think is the top thing that um, young people should be focused on in this moment? Definitely don't underestimate your voice um, and don't underestimate what you can do. Um, again, like Michael mentioned, especially with the pandemic, but even so, um, your voice matters and you don't have to be on the streets protesting. You have, a, I'm pretty sure you have a Facebook, you have an Instagram, some type of social media. It could start with a post, a thread, be open to conversation about the, uh, all the issues that we're facing. Keep an open mind, understand as Anushka and Michael both mentioned that not everyone's gonna agree, not everyone's gonna try to understand, but for those that are willing, try to work with them. Start having the conversation, start pushing for more than just painting black matters in the streets. Let's have it painted in our hearts. Thank you, well said. Mark Willow. Sure. So I will add to the conversation for young people to say that, again, there's a place for us all in this movement, whether it's giving your time um, in the protesting, whether it's donating your dollars. Uh, I've also made a conscious effort to spend my dollars more so with uh, black owned businesses. Be very intentional of how you're spending your money. Um, I think that's very important in the movement right now, as well as be more active and engaged from a political and policy standpoint. Um, just knowing not only who the president is and when those November elections come around, but also knowing when your local elections are coming around and how the your local council affect change within your own community. So just being a voice and an ear and advocate in your own community. Um, when it comes to the seasoned people, I think um, I would just say to them, be open to change and understand that yes, we thoroughly do appreciate all that you all have contributed to our um, success in the history of this country, but be okay with um, the newer and the younger generations pivoting to a new way of um, how we protest and how we organize and things of that nature. Because yes, we understand that you all have done it a certain way, but sometimes trying a new method also um, works as well. So just be open up how the young folks today are organizing and mobilizing and things of that nature. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, Michael. I would say um, for the young folks, the big thing we have to focus on is not making this moment be in vain. So we, D2 had mentioned earlier about the intersectionality of the various struggles that folks go through. 
and like as we're doing this movement advocating for black folks we got to remember that it's for all black folks and it's for all marginalized folks like i'm a black gay guy from kansas city kansas from a lower middle class family and like i am all of those identities simultaneously wherever i go all of the time and like one does not discount the other and so it's of the utmost importance that we're not leaving folks out, that we're not having those systems of misogyny or homophobia or transphobia in our movement, because we go, we're gonna need everybody and we have to bring everybody into the movement if we truly wanna make long lasting and wholehearted change. For my seasoned folks, I would say that this is an opportunity to leverage the platforms that you have within your organizations, within your companies, I do want to like, in this answer, touch on um, Binda's question a bit about just different way, things you can do in regards to protests and things that you can do as a seasoned person. So like, you don't have to go out on the streets and protest, but you can leverage your organization or company to make big donations. You can encourage them to invest in an outside consultant because if you might not be able to deliver the message about what they need to do, consultants can always come in and they can be unfiltered with the organization, with the company. They can come in and tell them that y'all are racist and y'all are not doing a good job and it's bad for business. And a consultant doesn't have the risk of being fired or retaliated against in doing so. So leveraging your platform to ensure your organizations are doing their part in this movement and not staying stagnant or staying silent and also using your wisdom and your experiences and your lived experiences to help support like the young folks and reminding us of the history of how we got here and making sure that we don't make mistakes as we're making this process come to fruition for real for real so just being that resource to lean on being that community behind us and being willing to lend that helping hand that phone call for advice telling your organizations and companies to open their purse to really make things happen. All right. Thank you, Michael. Um, Anishka. Um, I'm thinking about a webinar that I was on a few weeks ago to listen into one of the greatest thinkers of modern history, Dr. Angela Davis. And she had a quote that I've been thinking about every day. And she said that we are stuck on a treadmill of reform. And I've been thinking about that a lot because reform is different from uh, abolition or justice, right? Reform is piecemeal. It's small increments of getting close to what justice is or inching toward what justice is, but never getting quite far enough. And I'm thinking about the seasoned folks in my life, in my personal life, in my professional life, in my academic life. And I want to use a word that we talked about earlier. I want seasoned folks who come with the lived experience and knowledge that they do to be accomplices for not reform, but for justice. Because when we settle for reform and we settle for piecemeal uh, offerings, essentially, from the state, we'll get less than that every time. It's negotiation 101, right? You never come to the table and ask for 50% of what you want. You demand 200% of what you deserve and you never stop because you will never get that 200%. The struggle for that justice is going to be um, endless. Um, so that's one of the things that I would like to empower the seasoned people in my life to do, which is be the accomplices to younger people um, to demand the ultimate form of justice in every realm of injustice that exists right now. And I would say the number one priority for young people right now should be keep your foot on the gas. The news is getting tired of reporting about this. Um, companies are going to stop posting Black Lives Matter on Instagram next week if they haven't already. People are going to stop caring and it's not because the system isn't working. It is working exactly how it was designed to, to commodify the pain and injustice that a lot of us feel and uh, when it stops being marketable to stop promoting it. And if we keep our feet on the gas if we put our money where we can if we support local organizations if we empower young people who are putting their minds and bodies and energies on the line to protect our marginalized communities um, they won't be able to ignore us and so it is long and arduous work 
but uh, we have energy. We are young. We've got time and uh, I will be out there and I know y'all will be too. So I'll see you there. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I want to thank all of you. You are amazing. You are awesome. I don't know if anybody told you this this morning that you are phenomenal and your superpower is your leadership. Y'all are leaders. And that's what we talk. That's why we created the Mark One program is to find the leaders, give them some support and help y'all do what y'all do. <clears throat> and I sleep, I, I'm going to sleep good tonight because I, you know what? I know that there is uh, a, the next wave of young people who are not waiting, but who are right now, <clears throat> right now in the midst of making it happen. I, and I like the uh, Black Enterprise CEO that says, so what is success? Success is passing the baton to the next generation so that they can run hot, they can run faster and that, and that they can jump higher. And, um, and all of you, you know, are already have either got the baton or you're making it happen. So we appreciate you. We uh, celebrate you. We're here to support you. We know you can call on us at any time as you continue to um, move the ball forward. And you know there's always a place for you to make a difference here at Urban Financial Services Coalition. So we could always use uh, some of that young, bright talent um, to make a difference. And so um, with that, we do have um, some upcoming activities. We do have a young man next week, um, Jason Matthews. He's out of the Bay Area. And um, he will be sharing um, some information on his new book, The Age of Self-Reliance. Um, so it's going to be 6 uh, p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry. It's going to be 9 a.m. Pacific um, Standard Time, 12 um, p.m., 12 noon um, Eastern, um, Eastern Daylight Time. I always get that mixed up. Um, Dr. Amanda Carr is going to get me straight. Um, on the uh, on my time zone, um, but we have that um, next week. And if you're not a member of Urban Financial Services Coalition, we do invite you to become a member <clears throat> of our organization. Uh, we're committed um, to the development of young people, like these young people. And there's so many more out there um, that we want to um, help develop and position um, for success. Um, that we want to continue the legacy. And then those who are passionate about economic um, justice. You know, let's get on, let's use our time, our talents, and our treasures um, to fight this fight. If it's anybody who can fight economic justice, it's minority financial professionals. So we know what we're talking about, we've lived it, um, and then we can be a part of the solution. And so if you're interested in becoming a member, you can visit us, visit us at um, ufscnet.org, um, or if you want to make a donation to the organization, you know, you can also do it at that um, location. And I always like to end with this phrase is, um, and it's my challenge, it's a personal challenge uh, to all of you is to be a river <clears throat> and not a reservoir. And what does a, res a reservoir do? A reservoir keeps all the information, all the information and everything that it has, it keeps it to itself. And then what happens? Things die within the reservoir. Um, but when you become a river, you take all the goodness um, that you have, all your time, all your talent, all your treasures, and you take it downstream, and everywhere you touch, things turn green. Your relationships are better. Your money goes longer. <laughs> Your spouses smile happier. You know, everything get better. The parties are, par are, are even more exciting. The anniversaries, teacher, are even better anniversaries when we, uh, when we share that information. Um, and so right. <laughs> um, I'd like to everybody to unmute yourself, say thank you to these young people, and wish everybody a good night. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I love thank you. you. I'm looking you, forward to hearing from you all. I'm looking forward to hearing from you all. I need to hear from you, Michael, Elise, Anesta, <laughs> Marquelo. I need you guys. I need you. <laughs> Absolutely. I love you guys. Have a wonderful day. call me. Yeah, I will. I'll call you, Petra. Okay, okay great. Thank See you, D2. Bye, everyone. Bye. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right, Petra. Thank you. See you later, Ola. We'll talk it's soon. Good job, y'all. Okay. Care. You too. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Great evening. Great evening. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs>
great evening. Thank <laughs> you.